very much for uh, inviting me to this event. What I'm going to do is basically just um, put a spotlight on certain issues and highlight them for further discussion because there simply isn't enough time in 15 to 20 minutes to talk about any of the issues involved here in an exhaustive manner. So what I want to talk about is a little bit definitions and taxonomies, then some histories, benefits and challenges of collaborations between artists and technologists. I'm also going to discuss the funding and support a little bit more from a US perspective because I think that might be informative for efforts that are going on in the EU and also about labs, initiatives, exhibitions, uh, dissemination and perhaps one uh, sample and really just in order to start a discussion about these um, issues today. So please do not expect anything uh, exhaustive uh, here. So I think we have to make some major um, distinctions when it comes to discussing this subject. First of all, whenever we're talking about digital art or new media art as digital born art that is created by means of stored and uh, distributed by means of digital technologies, we're talking about art and technology in the first place. So this is an art form that always involves technology and wouldn't exist without it. So that's different from um, working with a painter and enhancing painting through, let's say, some um, audiovisual technologies embedded. Number one, there are artists who are technologists. Most of the pioneers in uh, technologically based art forms and new media arts were programmers, were the people who actually invented and created the technologies. So they did not necessarily collaborate with any technologists, they were the technologists. And now we have new media, digital art programs, um, and many programs of that kind around the world. So the students trained in these fields also have a technological background very often. Then there are artists working with technologists, and these artists may be technologists themselves in a specific um, area, but need to hire um, an engineer or someone else to implement and develop a project. Very often in these teams, this is actually the technologist is a hired gun rather than a collaborator which very often also has led to problems on this front because it turns out that uh, the technology itself and the technologist very much shapes the conceptual aspects of a work. So there's a lot of potential for tension here and something that needs to be figured out. And then there are the true quote-unquote art technology science collaborations and I think that is a very different thing from artists just working with technologies because in these collaborative um, efforts you're really pushing very often the boundaries of either discipline. In many of the examples I could give about art science collaborations, artists are actually working with or trying to develop uh, scientific aspects that do not yet exist and there are numerous examples of that. Eduardo Katz's work for um, example um, envisioned te technologies or um, scientific aspects and very often here it's a question of getting a scientist or technologist exciting, excited about that um, type of pursuit or inquiry to get them um, on board. So it's not something that simply um, works by throwing people together. So um, Camille already mentioned the histories of participatory and technological art going back to the 50s and 60s. Again, Bell Labs uh, played a major role in developing these. And it's actually very interesting to see how many art groups, which you see here at the, um, at the bottom, you know, from independent uh, group to um, Le Mouvement Grave, 
um, and the systems group were actually working with technologies at the time. And this really was the influence of cybernetics, which in basically had invaded pretty much every discipline in the humanities and in science at the time. Of course, that also died down once um, cybernetics became kind of consumed, absorbed by IT, dropped out, and the art dropped out of the art historical um, canon, ultimately, and was subsumed under conceptual art for a while. So that's also something very important um, to look at, I think. Um, also, if you just think about the origins of computing, of course, there is the connection to um, craft, to weaving, to design. What you're looking at here is the punch card operated um, loom in Norway and, of course, the, the loom weaving computing, you know, go hand in hand. That's also a connection that artists have over the decades explored in many, many different um, ways. It has already been mentioned, experiments in art and technology. I think we have a lot to learn from these historical precedents. What you see at the uh, bottom open score by um, Rauschenberg, developed in co collaboration with other artists, and then um, Inatovich's um, Senster and Sam. Uh, which were part of uh, cybernetic uh, serendipity here at the ICA in London. So I want to talk a little bit about benefits and challenges that art and technology or art um, science collaborations can bring about. This by no means, again, is an exhaustive um, list. But I think that the digital age has the potential to bridge various gaps between art, technology, and science. I don't want to bring up uh, in detail again CP's nose to cultures. So many of the labs working in these um, areas are trying to create a third culture on that front. Of course, we also have to distinguish between technology and science. Technology per se is not science, which I think is also very important to what we're talking about here. Um, what I do think is crucial is that in the digital age and with digital technologies, the technologies of representation and the ideas in art and science and technology are constantly converging. And three examples of that would be the understanding of content as a flow of information, the mapping of various uh, data sets. Uh, issues of representation and simulation, you know, what is reality today as we're moving more and more towards a convergence <coughs> between the virtual and actual. So what also can be created here is a dialogue on the interaction between the actual, the virtual, the hypothetical, uh, you know, I, our whole society is driven by data streams and data processing and uh, data collection today. What does that um, actually mean from a humanities point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from an artistic point of view? So I think these are very important dialogues that can be started on this um, front. And ideally, there also can be hybrid practices and new forms of knowledge production that um, basically evolve out of these collaborations. And of course, that's um, you know a very high set goal and it doesn't always happen and does not always need to happen, but I think it's um, a potential here. Challenges. So one of the challenges um, is the tra very traditional definition of objectives of art and technology or art and science. And I do not believe, as so many others, that these are true, but traditionally science and technology are so often connected to validation of findings, of proof and objectivity. And art is the uh, freewheeling, non-scientific speculation, sensual and emotional and uh, full of freedom of expression beyond accuracy, none of which pretty much applies to the um, art science collaborations that we've already seen this uh, morning. So we also have to do away with these cliches <coughs> to some point. Not that there isn't some truth um, to it, you know, but at the same time I think um, this understanding can be a main obstacle to uh, art and science collaborations. Language and vocabulary is um, a huge 
huge um, obstacle typically in interdisciplinary work, much more so than one would think. You know? So in all of these collaborations, it's really important to define what one is talking about and how one understands disciplines. And I um, hear that from the artists and the scientists all the time. And most important is also the definition of roles uh, in these collaborations. Again, something um, that is struggled with. And these are only a couple of the challenges we might talk about. Coming back to the um, history, Ken Noden, who was um, at Bell Labs and so much involved in some of the f by now really famous collaborations, wrote um, this very nice essay on the frustrations of collaborating with artists. Um, he actually did this long after the fact. So, um, and he is quoting himself from earlier statements he made. So in 1972, one of the things he said, both groups are creative, imaginative, intelligent, uh, energetic, etc. But programmers tend to be painstaking, logical, inhibited, cautious. The artists, on the other hand, are freer, alogical, intuitive, impulsive, implicit, perceptive, etc. So then he later on, of course, saw this um, as a pothole in his lifelong trail of paper, which he then, by his own assessment, turned into a crater by um, claiming things or raising questions such as uh, a work of art must answer some of these questions for what technical or emotional problem is it a demonstration or a search of what dialogue is it a cont uh, continuation and I think um, <laughs> asking art to demonstrate technology or science is of course a recipe for bad art yeah? that was also the main uh, issue in the tech bubble and boom of the late um, 90s of uh, technology companies basically asking artists to um, show their um, show of their technology you know artists as the content providers um, for it and of course so many collaborations have failed on that um, front you know. so um, there are a few um, other cliches that Ken Knowlton is um, quoting here his own and um, he then also gives an assessment of the collaborations I have talked to him more recently for an article he mostly saw himself really as the engineer in the collaborations rather than someone who was involved in the artistic process which is not um, ideal of course I think ideally both sides should transcend the boundaries of their own uh, discipline if they are full collaborators. Out of respect for both the living and the dead, he also doesn't give a, um, a completely in detail uh, assessment. But I think it's very important to return to these um, early ideas. What we re really need at this point in time is assessment of programs, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and a mechanism for sharing them. And that is definitely something uh, that isn't in place yet. So in the um, US, I want to talk a little bit about art and technology funding and uh, support. There are at least some overarching initiatives which are driven mostly by, by the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. So there is, luckily, a movement from STEM, the um, science, technology, and engineering math part of education and funding, to going full steam ahead to STEAM, including the arts in um, this type of funding and collaboration. And uh, one of the initiatives emerged that emerged from that is SEAT, the Network for Science, Engineering, arts and design. So this is really um, backed by the NSF and by the uh, NEA. So they have done workshops and conferences and what in turn emerged from that are uh, white papers that have been written and by now also reports on white papers. Within the uh, many, many white papers submitted here, I was an advisor for um, at least one of them 
13 key ideas and clusters were developed. And there are two reports on these white papers. They're all available online. You can download them if you haven't um, read them yet. But I think they also provo provide some interesting background on steps to an ecology of network knowledge and um, innovation, for example. So I think that was um, an important effort. What we're looking at here, again, you can download it online, which would allow you to zoom in, which I can't do here, is a map that Gabriel Harp has created on how um, the funding at the NSF has changed over time to incorporate um, the arts. So zooming in at least a little bit, you can uh, see what is being mapped here are actually uh, arts-related research. So research in which the arts play a role to some extent. And you can see to what kind of areas that um, is connected. So talent development and uh, HCI and information are huge uh, blocks here. And um, education also, anthropology to some extent. Uh, if you zoom in further, you could actually see the titles of the uh, respective proposals and uh, research in more depth how that has developed um, over time. But what you can see here that the interest in it has been growing enormously, the funding uh, has been growing enormously. So I want to talk a little bit about labs and their different approaches and the different configurations. There is no one model for a lab. So one example is the BioArt lab at the School of Visual Arts in New York. There are a lot of BioArts related um, initiatives. I don't think that it's easy to uh, disconnect ICT at this point from any other um, science because even the bio arts you know have a lot of ICT involved um, in them so in this particular case the lab which was created mainly by Suzanne Anker at SVA is something that comes out of the interests of a faculty member not the fact that the School of Visual Arts actually has labs and research for the bio arts so here we have an artist ultimately pushing research and initiatives into a certain direction and looking for the funding to build it. Um, at uh, the University of Western Australia, again, um, bio arts, life sciences related, we have Symbiotica, which is a different um, model, also artist driven and many of you um, may be familiar with uh, Symbiotica's work. And then at UCLA, the University of California at uh, Los Angeles, we have the Art Sci Center and Lab, again, driven partly by um, a faculty member, or Victoria Vesna um, has been the one behind it in many, many uh, ways but also deriving from close collaboration with research labs at the university. I mean, the university network in uh, California is of course very research driven, and UCLA has um, a very good nano lab. So Victoria's work and a lot of other work at this um, lab is actually coming from the nano um, sciences. But um, it has also grown, so there are genotype hacking workshops uh, happening at the lab. There are artists in uh, residence and many, many other initiatives connected to it. But what is important here as a model is, I think, the much needed um, proximity to actual research and research uh, facilities. There's um, not much use to a lab that does not offer an artist any technologies, any research um, facilities, or at worst asks the artist to bring those um, in. So what we're looking at here are different um, models. So just mentioning one European example, the artist in labs collaboration between the Zurich University and the Federal Office for Culture. This is a program that has been going on for uh, some time. And I'm just going to mention one example art project that has come out of it, uh, which was done by Adrienne Wurzel, and she worked there with the roboticists 
mainly. So what you're looking at um, here on the top left is the A mouse, you know, a recreation of a robotic um, mouse and its uh, vision system and the fish. And Adrienne um, examined this from a, a humanities philosophical um, point of view, but bringing in the natural scientists and what roboticism uh, is really uh, doing by creating both a film and a proposal for an installation. And I'm going to show you um, a short clip here. And what you're going to hear is actually oops. How do I get the... Yeah. Wait a second. We feel technologically in that area. ...quadrupedic model of rapid locomotion inspired by some sort of biomechanical paradigm. Albeit this sounds artificial and reminiscent of something man-made, but this is the only way I can explain how the animal forms its idiosyncratic system of rapid and robust late locomotion. So what you just listened to was actually Charles Darwin. So this is all from his chapter 17 of the Voyage of the Beagle. So what Adrienne does is basically uh, map Darwin's findings of species to the different creatures within the robotics labs. And it's amazing how it actually maps and what it tells you about the um, the process of the natural sciences and of um, robotics in this particular case. I also want to go over a few initiatives. One of the very early ones was ASCII, um, which has existed since 1988, um, combining um, different kinds of approaches to the sciences, putting on um, basically a lot of um, conferences, events, salons for exchanging um, knowledge about research and art and science collaborations. Another very, very different example of an initiative is SARC Scientists Art, uh, Artists Research Collaborations. Um, this is at the Santa Fe based First Mile Institute and they are actually working with uh, Los Alamos and those types of labs for their artist residencies and um, one program, Artists um, in Residence program, they put on together with um, ISEA <coughs> and Santa Fe for basically showing and showcasing um, work. Yet another program which I'm sure many of you are familiar with is Seven on Seven, Rhizomes um, conference and initiative that pairs seven leading artists with uh, seven technologists in, in day-long events, basically, where they brainstorm storm together and develop uh, technologies. And Synergies, which is um, affiliated with um, MIT and the Woods Hole o uh, Oceanographic Institution is yet another example of that. So, again, what is important here is the different models of this. One of the crucial questions, I think, is how much information or background work is the organization doing and providing the um, artist with? You know, do they basically already categorize the uh, scientific research done by different people, make that available to artists, or sometimes they're very much relying on the artists taking the first steps and finding out um, about the scientists' uh, interests, research, in terms of uh, enabling productive collaborations, I think you also need to do a lot of that background um, work and help the artists out rather than uh, letting them do all the work in um, basically assessing research and finding out what is a, a match. I think uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind. I am um, on the advisory board for the SETI Institute's Artists in Residence program, which has just been established, and we are actually still very much trying to figure out, um, you know, what the criteria for selection are and how to enable productive um, collaborations here. Um, Art and Bio Collaborative, final example I want to mention, there are also some uh, initiatives this one uh, affiliated with Mass Art in Boston that allow for field trips that take people, students, artists, 
to different um, countries, into different uh, environments. So I think that type of practical uh, research and on a global level is also an important um, aspect and can be very um, productive. Very important is outreach and dissemination. It's great to do all of these um, wonderful collaborations, but how do we actually distribute the knowledge about them? How does it feed into disciplines? I think what is very much needed is a centralization of that to some extent, to really have government funded or EU funded or NSF funded um, basically dissemination systems you know, where people can learn more about it. So, of course, there have been many, many exhibitions of art science collaborations, art and technology collaborations over time. I mean, Watermans has done a lot of work, apparently, as um, Irina has shown. So the Pasadena Arts Festival is focused on these issues. And I also um, want to point out that there is a long history to that and that um, this type of collaboration drops in and out of favor within the art world. So the 1986 Venice Biennale was actually um, focused on art and science uh, and was on the one hand looking at histories of it, going back to even alchemy and the Wunderkammer. And at that time there obviously also was a lot of um, interest into it, although if you look at the roster of artists here, they are very classical artists. There still is, um, I think, a very um, contentious relationship between the traditional mainstream art world and uh, this type of work, new media work. When I did the um, Whitney uh, Biennial, 2002 Whitney Biennial selection of uh, net art at the time, a, a, a comment I got so much within the press from the New York Times to the Wall Street journal was this belongs into a science museum and that wasn't meant as a compliment and if you look at the work however that I think would be hardly what you would conclude because probably everybody would say where's the science here there's no science just the fact that technology was um, involved into it at all Leonardo is of course um, one of the magazines and journals and platforms which ha by now is including the, the journal, the uh, music journal, the electronic almanac, the whole book series that has been very influential in distributing information and sci art in America is um, yet another publication that is focusing on these um, issues but also still very much on an introductory level, why sci art? Um, for example. So I'm, in closing, I just want to mention one project I um, have shown at the Whitney, again by Adrienne Wurzel, and that was part of the exhibition Data Dynamics in 2001. It was called um, Camouflage Town. The director, Max Anderson, at the time said, I think this is the first NSF-funded project that we've ever shown at the Whitney Museum. So for the exhibition, Adrienne had created um, a robot, actually it is an off-the-shelf um, robot that is uh, used as a tour guide. So she appropriated that, working with um, another scientist who was also the co-PI on um, the NSF grant, and um, created a cultural curmudgeon, a kind of personality. The robot was, um, when left alone, um, it was actually assuming the role of this creature who found itself on a battleground, on a contested battleground, on a very metaphorical level within an art museum and straddling, straddling the boundaries between art and science. Um, online you could uh, navigate the robot through the space of the museum. You could speak through the robot, so the robot would constantly, or people around the world would constantly have conversations with the people within the museum space. You could switch between five security um, cameras and view the museum uh, through that robot. And it was just amazing um, to see how effective it was on commenting on virtual identity or how technological identity is constructed. There were people just um, in awe and wonder that this machine would speak to them. Um, then I also saw kids immediately figuring it out and using the robot as a video phone, calling their friend in the middle of the country to go online and have a conversation 
um, with them within the museum space. Uh, there was a very complicated navigation system uh, on the ceiling. The red dots you see are actually part of the navigation system for the robot uh, that it was used and it would use, and it was not supposed to go into the elevator. Sometimes by mistake, it would do that, and then of course lose the navigation overhead navigation system and spin around out of control. And I was just thrilled by someone calling me from the museum and saying, "We have a problem. The robot went uh, into the elevator and attacked people." <laughs> and that you know, this idea that this machine could actually have that form of agency was just the um, absolutely perfect example of what this play with uh, virtual identity within this art project um, was doing. I'm also bringing up this by now older project um, because it, I do not think that it would be possible to do this again. This happened before September 11th. And after that, so many institutions, airports, etc., took off their webcams, of course. I do not think that it would be easy within a museum space to um, convince um, administrations to allow you to switch between security cameras and give people, you know, open online access uh, to them for um, basically uh, checking out a space. Also, um, uh, privacy issues have become so much more complicated. I've often spent months with lawyers working on the zoom factor of cameras um, to um, basically prevent that people could be identified online. You know, images of the public not being stored in any of the artist systems are um, crucial. So there are lots of discussions to be had and um, some of these um, aspects have become impossible by now. And I think, yeah, I'll just end it here for further discussion. Thank you very much.